the compound urea, H2NCONH2, is widely used in chemical fertilizers. The complete Lewis electron dot diagram for the urea molecule is shown above. A. Identify the hybridization of the valence orbitals of the carbon atom in the urea molecule. So hybridization, we're going to use Vesper theory. So the carbon atom here in the center of the urea molecule has four bonds um, in three bonding directions. So there's three atoms bonded to the central carbon. And this uh, Lewis dot diagram, electron dot diagram has all the lone pairs shown, and obviously the carbon doesn't have any lone pairs. So we have three atoms bonded to carbon, that's a steric number of three, and a geometry that is trigonal planar. And the trigonal planar molecular geometry has sp2 hybridization. B. Urea has a high solubility in water, due in part to its ability to form hydrogen bonds. A urea molecule and four water molecules are represented in the box below. Draw one dashed line to indicate a possible location of a hydrogen bond between a water molecule and the urea molecule. So let's talk about hydrogen bonds first. So a hydrogen bond is a strong non-bonding interaction that forms when a hydrogen atom bonded to a strongly electronegative atom interacts with uh, a lone electron pair on a nearby electronegative atom. Specifically, hydrogen bonding happens when a hydrogen atom bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, so those are highly electronegative atoms, when that when the hydrogen atom bonded to O, N, or F also interacts with the lone electron pair of another atom nearby. So we can get hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen atom, uh, so the gray circles on these four molecules are hydrogens of the water. So the hydrogens on the water molecules are attached to the electronegative oxygen atom, and so these um, hydrogen atoms on the water molecules could interact with the lone pair of electrons on the uh, nitrogen or oxygen atoms on urea. We could draw a dashed line between the hydrogen on the water and the oxygen on the urea. Alternatively, hydrogen bonding could occur between the hydrogen on urea, because the hydrogen on urea is bonded to an electronegative nitrogen. That hydrogen could do hydrogen bonding with the lone pair of electrons on the water. So we could also have hydrogen bonding there. Important, just do one of these op options. There's lots of different places to do it, but just choose one. The dissolution of urea is represented by the equation above. So urea solid is in equilibrium with urea aqueous. A student determines that 5.39 grams of urea, molar mass, 60.06 grams per mole, can dissolve in water to make 5 milliliters of a saturated solution at 20 degrees Celsius. The part C wants us to calculate the concentration of urea in moles per liter in the saturated solution at 20 degrees Celsius. So to get the concentration of urea, we need to have the moles of urea over the volume. So we have 5.39 grams of urea, and we can multiply that by the molar mass, which is provided right here. So one mole over 60.06 .06 grams. You multiply that out and you get 0 0.0897 moles urea. 
So now we know how much urea we have. And so 0 0.0897 moles of urea over the volume. And we have 5.00 milliliters as our volume. 5.00 milliliters is equal to move the decimal point over three times 0 0.005 liters. So in our calculation, we'll do 0 0.0897 moles over 0 0.00500 liters, keeping track of sig figs, and that gives us 17.9. Um, moles per liter, or you can do um, 17.9 and use a big M for molarity. Part D, the student also determines that the concentration of urea in a saturated solution at 25 degrees Celsius is 19.8 molar. Based on this information, is the dissolution of urea endothermic or exothermic? Justify your answer using Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle says that a system in equilibrium that is subjected to a stress, like an increase in temperature, will react in a way that counteracts the stress. So let's think through this logically. So the concentration at 20 degrees Celsius is 17.9 molar. We know that from part C. We also know that that's at equilibrium from this equation provided. So from there we can say that the solution is stressed by an increase in temperature. And the concentration changes, so at 25 degrees Celsius the concentration of urea is 19.8 molar. So upon stress, the stress is the increase in temperature, more urea dissolved. In other words, Upon an input of energy into the system, more urea dissolved to counteract the stress. Thus, the dissolution of urea is endothermic. Upon an input of energy, more urea dissolved. So the dissolution of urea is endothermic. It requires energy. It's energy absorbing. The equipment shown above is provided so that the student can determine the value of the molar heat of solution for urea. Knowing that the specific heat of the solution is 4.18 joules per gram Celsius, list the specific measurements that are required to be made during the experiment. So what they're talking about here, in terms of getting the molar heat of solution for urea, is that we would be adding urea to water and measuring the temperature change. So first we need um, the mass of water, because obviously the temperature change would be different if we have a teaspoon of water or a gallon of water. The temperature change is going to be very different depending on how much water we have. Likewise, we need the mass of urea. Same argument, temperature change is related to how much urea is being dissolved and how much water we have. And then we need the delta T, so the temperature change. Um, but that's broken into two different uh, bits of information. So we need the uh, T initial and T final. Uh, the initial temperature is uh, the temp of the water alone because we haven't added any urea, so we want to know the the initial temperature. And then the final temperature is the temp of the urea water solution. Because we've added the urea to the water and we want to know the final temperature. Part F, the entropy change for the dissolution of urea, delta S of solution, is 70.1 joules per mole Kelvin at 25 degrees Celsius. Using the information in the table above, calculate the absolute molar entropy of aqueous urea. So just one thing to note, the uh, superscript circle indicates the standard state. If we look at the equations page, we can see we have a formula delta S equals 
the sum of uh, s for products minus the sum of s for reactants. So we're looking for the absolute molar entropy of aqueous urea, and that would be uh, this, this s of products. So we're given that the uh, delta s of solution is 70.1 joules per mole Kelvin, and that's equal to what we're looking for, which is um, S of uh, urea aqueous minus absolute molar entropy of solid urea, which is given in the table, so 104.6 same units, joules per mole Kelvin. So easy to calculate. The mole, absolute molar entropy of urea aqueous is equal to uh, 104.6 plus 70.1 is 104. 74.7 include the units joules per mole Kelvin part G using particle level reasoning explain why delta S solution is positive for the dissolution of urea in water if we look back at that uh, equation again we have solid urea is in equilibrium with urea aqueous. That's the uh, equation for the dissolution. So in part F, they tell us that delta S solution is a positive number, so numerically we know that delta S is positive. So partic on a particle level, it makes sense that delta S solution is positive because we're going from solid to aqueous. It's the dissolution of urea. Urea in the solid state to urea in the aqueous state. And we know that um, urea particles in the aqueous environment have a lot more possible arrangements, configurations, um, freedom of motion than in solid urea. That goes for gases have higher entropy than liquids, which have higher entropy than solids. We know that at a particle level. So um, increased number of arrangements in the aqueous state correspond to a uh, positive delta S of solution for this dissolution. Part H, the student claims that delta S for the process contributes to the thermodynamic favorability of the dissolution of urea at 25 degrees Celsius. Use the thermodynamic information above to support the student's claim. So again, we can go back to our equations page and look at uh, this formula, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And so we know that the sign of Gibbs free energy indicates the reaction's spontaneity. So a negative delta G is a spontaneous reaction and a positive is non-spontaneous. So the delta S is positive. We know that from part F. They give it to us. It's positive 70. So positive delta S subtracts value from delta H in turn making delta G smaller. Positive delta X multiplied by temperature. So we have a positive value here. We don't know what delta H is, but we're, we're subtracting a positive T delta S from delta H so this makes delta G smaller, not larger. So in that sense, the delta S is making delta G closer to being negative. It's making delta G smaller, which is closer to being negative, contributing to thermodynamic favorability. So it's kind of confusing, but looking at it at the opposite way, so if delta S were negative, that would increase delta G and make the reaction less thermodynamically favorable. So it's not asking whether it's making it spontaneous or not, but you can kind of use the idea that 
a smaller delta G is more favorable. And because delta S is positive, it's taking away more from delta H, so that delta G is smaller, making the dissolution more thermodynamically favorable.